bring this three-part sermon series to a close. I, I hope you've enjoyed it. I really have. The idea was pretty simple, and that is to look back over the 25 years that I've preached here and to see if we could find a common theme, a thread that would run through a quarter of a century of, of messages, perhaps even revisit some of those messages, retell some of those stories, or restudy some of those passages. We certainly found a common theme and placed it under the title, Remember This. And the theme says, God came, God cares, God's coming again. It's kind of the brand message, not just of the church, but of the Bible. The Bible's core message is that God came in the form of a son, Jesus Christ. And he came and he cared and cares. He didn't come as a tyrant. He didn't come as a dictator. He didn't come to judge us, but to save us and to demonstrate God's heart of love for us. Jesus Christ is the only picture of God ever taken. So do you want to know how God thinks, how God looks, how God acts? Jesus Christ came. He is the presence of God on earth. And then God is coming again. That our hope and our future is built and based upon the promises of Christ that the best part of human existence lies ahead of us, that we were made for more than this life. Indeed, this life is a passing time, brief, quick, temporary, and it will soon be gone. And to live with the pilgrim mentality is absolutely essential to fulfill and enjoy what God has in store for us. Looking back over these uh, 25 years of messages, which there's a lot of them, big stack, made me grateful for everything that God has done in our church. But I got to tell you that the nostalgia and appreciation I felt looking back is very small compared to the excitement and the joy that I feel looking forward. We're in the greatest season in the history of this church. The Lord has blessed this congregation beyond our wildest expectations. He's even gone beyond our highest prayers. And the best days of the church lie ahead of us. I love Randy Frazee. I love the way he's leading our staff, directing us strategically into a new era in our church. And as much as I've loved the last 25 years, I can't wait for the next 25. And I think it's going to be awesome to see what God does. So in the theme of being excited about the future, let's talk for just a minute about heaven. And in the file that says Max's favorite illustrations... There is one that you might remember. It's not that it's a delightful story, but really more that it's an intriguing story and a reflection upon human nature. It's the story of Carl McCunn. Carl McCunn was a friendly, affable Texan who moved to Alaska in the late 1970s where he got a job with the Trans-Alaskan Pipeline. There he made some good friends and had some good times, but he concocted an adventure that has made its way into more than one book and puzzled residents of the 49th state for these decades that have passed. He came up with the idea of going on a photo expedition, a five-month trip in which he would be dropped in a distant part of the state of Alaska and spend the summer taking pictures. That in and of itself is not that unusual. He created the plan that his friends remember how he was prepared, how detailed he was in his preparation, how he uh, arranged for a plane to carry him in March of 1981 to a near, near the Colleen River at a remote lake, uh, some 75 miles north of the nearest town, Fort Yukon. He took a couple of rifles, a shotgun, 1,400 pounds of provisions, and 500 rolls of film. Who can remember when you had to have a roll of film to take a picture? He set up his tent and set about that season of uh, isolation, blissfully unaware of the oversight that it would eventually cost him his life. He had made no arrangements to be picked up. Of all the things to forget, he had a plane drop him off, but he didn't talk to anyone 
about making sure they would come back and pick him up. He didn't even realize his unbelievable blunder until August. And we know his thought process because he left behind a hundred-page loose-leaf diary that the Alaska State Troopers found near his body the following February. In an understatement the size of Mount McKinley, McCunn wrote, I think I should have used more foresight about arranging for my departure. The days shortened, the air chilled. He began searching the ground for food and the skies for rescue. By the end of September, the snow was piling and the lake was frozen and the supplies were nearly gone. By late November, he was out of food, strength, and optimism. And one of his final diary entries reads, This is sure a slow and agonizing way to die. Isolated, with no hope of rescue, trapped with no exit, nothing to do but wait for the end. A chilling story. And it's a puzzling story. How does that happen? Surely he knew it was a temporary stay. Surely he knew it was a short-term assignment. Surely he knew by its nature that time in the wilderness was intended to be just a season in his life. How can somebody know that and not make any preparation for the future? And yet people do that all around us. We live on a planet, we live in society that has no exit strategy. And most of the people, many of the people you know, simply have made no preparation. And they give little thought, if any thought, to what's coming next. The Bible is very clear in its description of this life as a short-term assignment. It's a temporary thing that we're passing through here. The Bible calls it a pilgrimage, a season, a short, passing. It's not like this excursion is going to last forever. God's grand answer to this life is the next life. Some of you are lonely today. Some of you are passing through a time of difficulty today. Some of you have some questions that are so difficult for any person to answer. God's ultimate answer for the loneliness, for the discouragement, for the questions of this life is the next life. Yes, we live in a world that is freighted and burdened with hurt and pain. But God's ultimate solution is a world with no hurt or pain. The world called heaven. How often do you think about heaven? How often do you let heaven cross your mind? If you're like me, I want to think about heaven more. And I've talked to many people who are curiously unenthused about heaven. The idea of doing something forever. On and on. Endless non-stop Gary Larson in one of his far side cartoon, cartoons depicts a winged man seated on a cloud in heaven no one is near him there's nothing to do he's marooned on his celestial post and the caption has him saying to himself I should have brought a magazine <laughs> well we can relate eternal life Is that good news? Harps on our laps, clouds in our midst, time on our hands, unending time. And what are are we going to do? Worship? We're going to sing forever? One hymn, then another, then another, then an endless (laughs) sing-along, then a solo, then a chorus, and then a song, and then a concert? It's hard to get excited about heaven if that's your concept of heaven. But God introduces a concept that is far different than halos and cloud banks and endless singing. Let's see what Jesus had to say about heaven. First of all, according to him, heaven is a perfect place. It's a place. He said to the disciples, don't be troubled. You trust God, now trust me. There are many rooms in my father's house and I'm going to prepare a what? A place for you. If this were not so, I would tell you plainly, when everything is ready, I'll come and get you so that you may always be with me where I am. So the movies are wrong. 
Those images of knee-high fog banks and disembodied spirits and floating spirits, forget them. Jesus has gone to prepare a place. Heaven is a perfect place. It's tangible. It's touchable. You will be able to reach down and touch the soil, feel the ground beneath your feet. You will have fragrances. You will feel light. You will feel temperatures. In fact, your garden with its soil and with its trees and with its fruit is an anticipation of the garden of the universe that awaits us. We assume that God is going to just destroy the earth and create something new that we cannot imagine and place us in it. But that doesn't make sense. When you think about the earth that God created, he said it was good from the very beginning, didn't he? He kept saying, now that's good. That's good. The seas are good. The light is good. The sun is good. God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. Why would God destroy what is good? He never denounces his universe. He never denounces his earth. He denounces the way we mistreat it, but he never denounces it. It in of itself is a wonderful creation by a wonderful God. He is the God of reclamation, not extermination. Jesus in Matthew 19, 28 says in the recreation of the world, When the Son of Man will rule gloriously, you who have followed me will also rule. I think we should expect and look for God to recreate the world. The prototype, the picture of the perfect world is what we can depict from Genesis chapter 1, the Garden of Eden. He is going to have his Eden after all. He will rightfully reclaim and restore everything as it was originally intended. But Max, what about those verses in the Bible that talk about destruction? What about when Peter and John use that A-bomb terminology? They say the earth will disappear with a roar, be destroyed by fire, laid bare, passed away. Won't this planet be destroyed? Yes, but remember, destruction does not necessarily mean elimination. Destruction can open the door and just create a path for reconstruction, kind of a clearing out so it can be restored. Our bodies, when we die, if we die before Christ returns, will decompose. I know this isn't a pleasant thought, but it's the truth. Our bodies will return to dust. But we believe that on the day Christ returns, on the great day, he will call us out of the grave or wherever we are, wherever our body has been positioned. He will call us out and he will recompose us. And those amino acids will rekindle. All of those molecular cells will reconfigure. Our brains will reignite. These physical bodies will take on the appearance of the body of Jesus Christ after he rose from the dead. We won't look like him, but we will be like him in the sense that we too will be of flesh and bone. We will have touchable flesh, movable bones, but we will be in a perfect state in the immortal. I'm sorry, the mortal will put on the immortal and we will enjoy God's perfect heaven in this perfect body. The same will happen with this planet. In some sense, God will, on the great day, destroy it. He will purge anything that is unholy from it. Anything that is unnecessary for the eternal kingdom will be burned away wherever it is in the universe. It will be purged and cleansed, but then it will be restored. Be restored. The book of Romans, the Apostle Paul has that interesting phrase, remember, in which he says, The whole of the universe groans and suffers the pains of childbirth until now. The universe is groaning as if it is tri- third trimester heavy. It's anticipating a deliverance, a, a change, something. It was not intended to live with tornadoes and hurricanes and Typhoons that ravage and destroy. There is coming a day of deliverance, of change, in which God will have his perfect universe, his perfect place, and look at this, he will have his perfected people. Heaven is a perfect place of perfected people. One of the reasons heaven will be heavenly is because you will be at your best forever. 
you will be at your best forever. Think of you at your best. Think of you when you're genuinely unselfish. Think of you when you're actually full of joy. Think of you when you don't have a worry in the world. Those are wonderful moments. That's a glimpse of you at your best, your saintly state. It's those times in between that trouble us when we are anxious, when we do speak harshly, or when we pass judgment prematurely, or we are overcome by fear. But listen, that part of you does not go to heaven. What goes to heaven with you is you at your best. God impounds imperfections at the gate. They don't go with you. Scripture says nothing that is impure will enter the city. That includes impure thoughts, impure motives, impure actions. You will be you at your best forever. God will take that which is impure and remove it. Now think about how that will be. Think about everything the devil has taken from you, I, I don't know, just in the last 24 hours. Think about those moments when you were critical or, or, or insecure or angry. Those moments will be, the devil goes around pickpocketing your joy and stealing your happiness. That's his job. But he won't have that job in heaven. You see, heaven will be heavenly because hell's captain won't be there. He just won't be there. And he will be banished into a lake of fire where he will be forever and ever, separated from God's people. And he cannot, you will not be tempted because he cannot tempt. He will have no access to you. He knows his days are numbered. Maybe the most exciting description of heaven is just in this phrase in Revelation 22, 3. There shall be no more curse. No more curse. The curse is a consequence of sin, of rebellion. Heaven is populated not by people who have rebelled, but by those who have returned. In heaven, you will enjoy the fruit of your decision to follow Christ forever. You will not be tempted to turn away from him. Your time will not be spent battling the devil as it is today. He will not have access to you. Hence, you will not stumble. The world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. This world is passing away. And what? The lust of it. The, the temptation of it. The lures of it. The seductions of it. That's going to all be gone. Can you imagine your life with nothing but wholesome desires? And can you imagine this world, a society, where everyone is at their best? You see, even when you're at your best, I'm not at my best. And I mess you up. And when you're at your best, your husband's not at his best. And he messes things up. And when you're at your best, your wife is cranky. And that messes things up. The part of the challenge of this planet is that we've never known since the days of the Garden of Eden a season in which everybody's hitting on all cylinders. We're all falling short. Even those who have been redeemed by Christ continue to struggle. But there is coming a day in which we will enjoy the perfect society. The perfect society. And there will be no rivalries. There will be no prejudice. There will be no enmities. There will be no hatred. There will be no swords. There will be no rifles. There will be no wars. Won't that be a great day? A great day in which finally, the scripture says, the lion will lie down with the lamb. In other words, the people that you would think would never get along with each other will lie down with each other and be at peace together because we will be perfected people made perfect by the miracle of Jesus Christ in redemption. Scripture says God will wipe away every tear there will be no more death, no sorrow, nor crying, for the former things have passed away. So those former things that plague you today will have passed away. That means no thieves, no divorce, no heartbreak, and here it is, no boredom. No boredom. Remember this, please. 
you won't be bored in heaven because you won't be you in heaven. This form of you. This form of you. We have to be careful and not filter our understanding of heaven through earthly physics. A transition is going to happen. And we are going to be raised in a glorified body, in an immortal body, which means that we won't be limited by what limits us today. And what limits us today is a short attention span, ever waning energy, and a tendency to focus on ourselves. We get bored, right? Check me on this. Because we have a short attention span. Some of you right now are having a hard time focusing on this wonderful sermon. <laughs> We have a short attention span. We have waning energy. We just flat run out of energy. Our eyelids droop. We begin to get tired. Whatever it is that keeps us energized, we, we got to get our tank refilled every so often with a good night's rest, and we get bored. And we get bored because we get focused on ourselves. And if it's not about me, I'm not interested, right? I'm tired of talking about you. Let's talk about me, right? <laughs> And so that's, that's where we get bored. Okay, so extract those three sources of boredom. And guess what? You are a new you in heaven. You will inhabit a body that never gets tired, a brain that never loses its attention span. You will be able to focus and maintain your attention and thought on one topic for day after day after day after day without getting tired, without getting bored. And listen, without getting restless because you don't care if it's about you or not. You're caught up in the rapture and in the beauty of who God is and what God has done. This is how we were meant to be. This is how Adam and Eve were for a time. And this is how we will be for all of eternity. So don't get too caught up in being concerned about the endless nature of heaven. Yes, we serve a God who is so perfect and so beautiful. We need an eternity to explore all of his beauty. You're not going to get tired. You're not going to be bored. And here's another thought that you might not have considered. You're going to have some assignments in heaven. You're going to have some jobs to do. The scripture talks about Adam and Eve and God said, let them have dominion. He gave them dominion. They had responsibility. He mantled the couple with leadership over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Adam was placed in the garden to tend and to keep it. The same will be said about us. God's servants shall serve him. Jesus said, we will hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will now place you responsible over many. You will have responsibilities in heaven. You might oversee the orbit of a distant planetary system. You might design a mural in the heavenly city. You might monitor the expansion of a new species of plants or animals. Isaiah 9, 7 says of the increase of God's government, there will be no end. God is a God of increase. He is a creator. So he will be creating new systems, new planets, new plants, new ideas, new songs. Maybe there are colors that have never been created. Maybe there are musical tones that have yet to be revealed to us. God may place you in charge of developing some of those. Beyond that, I don't know really what to tell you. I have a feeling that your earthly abilities are an indication of your heavenly responsibilities. Some of you who are wonderful architects, you may help design part of the new Jerusalem. As some of you who are masterful musicians, I, I expect to hear you singing again in heaven. Some of you who are wonderful cooks, we're going to have feasts in heaven. Bring your apron. I wouldn't bring the cookbook. I think you'll have new ingredients to work with. Some of us who are given to writing or creating, I think we'll have some stories to tell. Who knows? But don't think for a second that your best life is this life. God is preparing you for an eternal assignment and you will reign with him forever. One thing is for certain, you're going to love it. You're going to love it. You're never going to be weary, selfish, or defeated. You'll have a clear mind, tireless muscles, and unhindered joy. Heaven is a perfect place, a perfected people with our perfect Lord. 
Oh, the depth and riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. We serve a God who is so wrapped with wonders that we will spend eternity and could spend a million eternities just exploring his beauty. And Jesus gives us this promise. When everything is ready, I will come back. So apparently it's not ready yet because he has not come back. But he says, I will come and get you that you will always be with me where I am. John Todd was only six years of age when both of his parents died. As was the case in the late 1800s, he and his siblings were farmed out to aunts and uncles across the New England area where they lived. An aunt volunteered to take young John, John Todd in. John had never met this aunt. And so he was fetched and taken to his new home in Rutledge, Vermont. The aunt sent a servant to pick up John and bring him to her house. And when the servant arrived at John's house, John climbed up on the back of the horse, put his arms around this big man, and he was nervous, leaving the home behind where his parents had died, heading toward a new home where he knew no one had never seen anything. As they rode, he began to ask the servant some questions. And years later, he remembered this conversation. He asked, will she be there? Oh, yes, the servant replied. She'll be waiting up for you. Well, I like living with her. Oh, my son, you fall into good hands, he said. Will she love me? Ah, oh, she has a big heart. Will she be sleeping when we arrive? Oh, no, the servant said. She'll be sure to wait up for you. You'll see when we get out of these woods. You'll see her candle in the window. And sure enough, as they broke through the woods into the clearing, he could see the small house. And standing on the porch was his aunt. And as he was lifted down off the horse, she came and she picked him up and said to him, Welcome home. And she provided a home for young John Todd where he grew up. He went on to become a pastor and he ministered in New England for many, many decades. Later in his life, he received a letter from his aunt. The roles were now reversed. She was nearing death. And it was time for her to leave her home and head to her next home. And she was afraid. And so she wrote her nephew for encouragement. His letter included these words. My dear aunt, years ago I left a house of death not knowing where I was to go. Whether anyone cared, whether it was the end of me. The ride was long, but the servant encouraged me. Finally, I arrived to your embrace and a new home. I was expected. I felt safe. You did it all for me. Now it's your turn to go. And I'm writing to let you know that someone is waiting up. That your room is all ready. The light is on. The door is open. And you are expected. And dear church, I'm standing here to tell you that someone is waiting for you. And your room is ready. And your light is on. And you are expected. And that your best life will really begin in the next life. Till then, stay strong. Till then, think a lot about heaven. Let the promise of heaven give you strength today. And in the times in which you cannot answer the questions, and in the times when you cannot find the strength, let the promise of heaven be God's grand answer and your grand source of strength. Because with his help, you're going to see him face to face. And you'll know in that moment, it was all worth it. Let's pray together. <coughs> Father, would you please make heaven come to life in our lives today? Help us to think often about seeing you. 
Help us to imagine what it's going to be like to walk with you. Help us to to anticipate, to live in excited anticipation of the day that you come for us. So much, Father, that, that that excitement eclipses any discouragement that we have now. Oh, Heavenly Father, you're a good God. But we forget, and we do focus a lot on things of the earth, and we forget to think about heaven. But we welcome your spirit to awaken within us more and more thoughts about heaven. Lord, we thank you for the promise of our eternal home. Now, Lord, minister, please, to your church. We offer this prayer in the name of Christ, our Savior, coming for us. Amen.
Thank you.